Hey there, listener. It's Brianna, and you are listening to episode three of A Piece of Everything. Whoa! Hey, everybody! Que pasa? It's Bri here, and welcome back to another episode of A Piece of Everything, where we take a minute out of our busy lives and busy schedules to discuss cream of the crop, pop culture, and have weekly or semi-ish weekly chats on on topics relating to Marvel, DC, Star Wars, and anything else I feel up to talking about. But of course today, it's Star Wars, and we're continuing off of last week to talk about the rest of Visions, and I hope you've all been well, and that everything is okay, okay. Um, I've been doing quite good myself, and I mean, today just feels like the perfect Friday. It's a beautiful day today. And I expect it to be cold today, so I left the house this morning wearing a beanie and flannel, but when I actually went outside, it was so hot. But it's very nice out today. Um, so yeah, go outside. It's really, it's beautiful. Um, but like, why can't it just be cold already? Like, I just got out all my sweaters and coats, and now the weather decides to be unmatched with the season. So it, it does feel weird that it's fall now, but you know, I guess the cold will come eventually. Um, but yeah, apparently that's the weather for today. The podcast wasn't meant to have a weather segment, but we have one today, so that's cool. But one segment we do have now, or at least something that I'm trying to get started, is our weekly comic book novel TV whatever update. Um, so yeah, first thing on the list, um, I was able to finally get some more reading in last weekend and make the transition from the High Republic Adventures comics to The Rising Storm. So now I'm reading that. Yippee! Um, which, which means I should probably do a High Republic comic review, maybe on issues like one through six soon. Um, and yeah, I'll put that in, in line for, um, Star Wars topics for sure to do. Um, but I know that the High Republic comics now is like, they're pretty far. I want to say at least up to issue, um, like 12, maybe, or even more than that now. So, but, um, yeah, probably doing them in, like, bits of six is, would be, would be better. So, yeah, and I know I've been talking about The Rising Storm for the past couple of weeks, so I'm very excited to have gotten into it finally. I just, I feel the progress being made, and it, it seems great so far, as always. I'm, I'm still very early on into it, chapter two, I think, but the writing seems, it seems great. Um, I haven't read anything by, I think it's Kevin Scott, yeah, I haven't read anything by Kevin Scott yet. But it seems really good, so I'm really looking forward to just taking a few hours aside and just being able to dive into it and relax. So that would be some good times. And um, speaking of Star Wars books, Ronin is out now, so that's awesome. I checked on the date for it recently um, for its release after like getting the sudden urge to check, and it came out on the 12th, and today's the yeah, today's the 15th. But for some reason, it came out sooner than I expected. Like, I think I said last episode that I thought it was coming out in November, which was completely wrong, so discard that. But that's something really nice to have at our fingertips now. And I really just want to go to Barnes & Noble and, like, just look at it, because the cover looks so cool. Plus, I, I want to see how big it is. It's probably, like, a fat book, but, I mean, I read fat books now, so I'm good with it. Um, so yeah, as soon as I get the money, I'll go and buy it. You can count on that. Um, yeah, and next thing up, as another update that I forgot was arriving so soon, we can't forget about Young Justice Season 4, everybody. That's gonna start streaming on the 21st of this month, which is less than, it's less than a week away, which is crazy to think, because I've, we've been waiting for it forever, and we've had some delays and such, but to finally have it less than a week away is crazy, and I really want to see it because, no spoilers, but I'm just hoping it's better than Season 3. I mean, we can talk about that at a later date, but you fellow Young Justice fans who are listening, you probably understand what I mean by that. But I am eagerly awaiting that release as well. And as far as comics go, I did start Final Night as promised. If you guys remember, I'm about one page in, so it's progress. It counts. Um, but don't worry, I'll get into the, the swing of it eventually. But yeah, again, as I was saying last time, I'm reading it for Hal Jordan, and then we can get into Green Lantern and stuff. So I'm making my way, even if it's slowly, it's happening. So that is good news. And 
I also picked up a Spectacular Spider-Man trade. I have never read um, Spectacular Spider-Man comics before, so this is kind of exciting. But I have this list that is like, it has lead-up comics for Disassembled. So this is one of them. It's um, Spectacular Spider-Man Volume 3, Here There Be Monsters, if you guys have heard of it. I have not heard of it before, like, looking up this list. I have no idea what it's about. And I am buying, like, the trades out of order a little bit in my comics list, so um, I won't actually be reading Volume 3 until I read Numbers 1 and 2, and of course, um, a few others that are meant to be read in between. But I hope it's good. I, it looks very promising. And on top of that, I also bought the Secret War trade, um, not to be confused with Secret Wars, which they're not related at all. They're very different comics. Um, which is, again, a little ahead of what I'm currently working through, but it was a good deal. I couldn't pass it up. Like, if you see a comic book for $5, like a trade for $5, that's usually, like, I don't know, I want to say 20 or something, you buy it. That's just how it works. So I bought that. So yeah, and I'm excited about this because Daredevil's on the cover, and I'm really loving Daredevil comics right now, so I can't wait to eventually get to that. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty sure... That about wraps it up for our weekly book slash comic book update. So with that, we may step into the work of Visions once again. And oh, that reminds me. I wanted to ask, I mean, not that you could respond right away, but still. Um, I wanted to ask, how did you guys watch Visions? Like, what was your preference? Subtitles, no subtitles, Japanese, English? Um, for anime, I'm a Japanese sub person. So I had to go with my roots on this one and watch them in Japanese, like I usually do with anime. But I did compare the English voices with the Japanese voices with some of the episodes um, when doing some rewatching. And my final decision is that I liked the Japanese better for the most part. I will say that my one exception to that is for episode 7. Um, for that one, I like the English more, but mostly Japanese. So that's that's my recommendation to you and how to watch them if you haven't already. Um, but if you are all caught up to speed and you're all set, then that means we'll pick up right where we left off from last week in our discussion, which is with Episode 5, The Ninth Jedi. So we're going to start with that one. And this one is one of the ones that I went back and rewatched pretty soon after my first run-through. And I do think of it as my third favorite, because just because of some of the cool elements and moments that it had, but the episode itself, it started off pretty interestingly with kind of like a prologue, um, which I don't think the others, did the others have prologues? I don't think so. Uh, but yeah, it was interesting that it had a prologue. Um, just saying that the Ninth Jedi takes place during a time where Jedi are scarce, and this guy called the Margrave and a sabersmith are trying to help the surviving Jedi out by summoning them all to meet up at his Sky Temple, where um, the Margrave will reunite them with their sacred weapons of choice, which is, of course, lightsabers. Now, why was this prologue interesting to me, you may ask? Well, just because the way it was said leads me to believe that this story is meant to be happening either in the distant past or the very distant future of what we are familiar with Star Wars timeline-wise. Because it's not exactly Order 66, Palpatine, and Darth Vader Jedi type of extinct. Um, it just has a different feel than that, and it kind of sets a cool environment for the rest of this short. So that's the introduction, and it explains that a little bit. And um, something that I noticed about the Ninth Jedi here is that we get the whole concept of lightsabers being made for other people to use, like somebody making them for another Jedi to use. And not that it's something that's super foreign or crazy. I know that um, in the comics, Luke ends up picking up a Temple Guard lightsaber, and he uses that for a little bit, but just not quite like this. And you know, not to be that person who reads too deep into it, but I was trying to think of the one guy, um, if the one guy making all those lightsabers for all those different Jedi could be accurate to the canon custom of how lightsabers are made. And, I mean, I guess it could, since the dude's a Jedi himself. I mean, well, we're never told that. I'm just assuming, since there was a part where he was getting shot at and he, like, deflects a blaster bolt with his hand... I don't think normal people could do that, so I'm just gonna assume he's a Jedi here. But it was really, it was pretty cool how the sabers themselves were constructed and worked, where they were directly attuned to the user's force type. Like when a Dark Force user had one, it was of course red, but when the Margrave took it right after, 
the same lightsaber immediately changed to green, which I loved seeing. It was very cool how that worked. But unfortunately, the sabersmith is caught while he's making the lightsaber, so... I mean, I keep wanting to say the Empire, but it's not the Empire. But he gets attacked and taken away by people who don't want him making these lightsabers. So now his daughter, Kara, has to get these um, lightsabers to the Jedi as she's getting chased down by these forces. And she does make it to the Sky Temple in one piece, so yay for Kara. But, I mean, as you guys could probably guess, this is my favorite part where... Everyone who met up at the Sky Temple is grabbing their lightsabers, and some of them slowly start to form a circle around Kara and um, this other Jedi, Ethan, and you could just feel it. Like, something does not feel right about this. And then it all gets confirmed as soon as they ignite the sabers, and all of them are red. And that was kind of just like a gasp moment, like, ooh, that just happened. Um, yeah, and it gets revealed to us that real Jedi had been on their way to meet the Margrave, but were intercepted and replaced with people sworn to the dark side. I didn't even see that twist coming at all. It was a great part. Um, some good writing was went into that, so big props to whoever came up with that idea. And it kind of had me shocked, so, I mean, that's a success. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a good part that I enjoyed. But then the Margrave was even smarter by being in the robot the whole time, um, watching over everything and everyone, which I also didn't see coming. So it was like, Uno reverse on that one. So he's a smart dude. And he's a great fighter, too. He was, like, slicing a Sith left and right every two seconds. He was not playing around. And yeah, it was cool to watch him fight the others, who I'm pretty sure knew the Margrave beforehand, just because of how they were, like, talking to him and using his real name, which is Juro. And I mean, no, that's not, like, a shockingly important detail or anything, but I just thought I might as well, I don't know, throw that in there. But one thing I have to say, though, that I initially thought, um, is that I thought it was a little bit unrealistic that, like, Kara could take on three of the Sith at once, having had no training and just natural talent. But, you know, not so much that it bothered me, but, I mean, I guess it kind of does make sense, because as she was fighting her lightsaber, like, goes from having no color to being green. It was a cool moment, and quite a nice touch, if I may say so myself. And, um, green does signify having strong power with the Force, so maybe the fighting skills are accurate. There you go. <laughs> but, um, I did feel bad for the Ethan guy who was there. Like, he's he's over here excited to even see a lightsaber, and then these bad guys just, like, kind of come up on him out of nowhere. And he's, like, a newer Jedi, or at least it seemed like that, um, because he said he has no master. But I'm glad he at least made it out alive. If he died, that would have made me sad. So, yeah, but like I was saying last week, the way that the story ended, it sounds like we could possibly get another episode out of the story. Um, like, with the Margrave, Ethan, and Kara, where they try to find Kara's dad, or maybe even some of the Jedi who got replaced by the Dark Force users on the way to the temple. I mean, if some of them lived, I, I don't remember. They they might have died, but I, I hope not. But, you know, maybe. But still, I would be in for another episode of The Ninth Jedi. And it was, it was definitely good enough for me to be able to see more, so I would be down for that. So yeah, that's everything about The Ninth Jedi. Again, one of my favorites, top three. Um, but now... We are brought to episode 6, which is T-0-B-1. Okay, so I don't know if you guys caught this, but T-0-B-1 in T-0-B-1 is almost an exact copy of Astro Boy. Um, I mean, there is a fairly recent animated... It's not even recent. It's in like 2003 or 4, um, but he was uh, originally a older 60s anime. So if you guys know who that is, you might not, but you should. Um, but Teaser B1 was just too similar to Astro Boy to not have been made in his image. But if you don't know about Astro Boy or the story behind him, which is pretty sad, actually. Um, to simplify it, he's basically a kid robot who wants to be a real kid. And to me, it's really funny because the guy who created Astro Boy looks exactly like the professor in, in episode six. And Astro Boy's real name is also Toby, which is what the letters and numbers spell out for the character and visions for this episode. So I just had to say and get that out that I truly believe T0B1 was based off of Astro Boy. Just saying. Too, there's too many parallels, but um, to the actual episode, we can talk about that now. Um, 
I would say that this episode, episode 6, could be likened to Tatooine Rhapsody in terms of kiddishness and lightheartedness, but in this one we have, like, a rampaging Inquisitor flying around and our Jedi friend, Master Mitaka. He does get killed, so it's slightly more serious in comparison. Um, but, but now to the point that I remembered after rewatching this a second time. I realized that it was kind of Toby, I'm gonna call him Toby because I, I can't say T0B1 every time, but, um, and that's his name, so. But I realized that it was kind of Toby's fault that Master Mitaka gets killed because he was messing around with this ship in the basement that he told him not to go near, and he literally calls to the Empire their exact location by calling for all Jedi through the comms. And, like, when you think about when this is supposed to be happening, like, during the time of the Empire, that's just the stupidest thing you could possibly do. So, that was definitely his fault, not gonna lie. He just summons them, um, and he summons these in- this Inquisitor who just destroys everything. Um, but after all of that happens... And the Inquisitor does his, like, first sweep of destruction. We see Toby continuing what the Professor wanted, which was to restore the desolated planet. Which he successfully does end up doing. And we see him, like, growing plants and stuff. And it eventually rains, so that's a nice little moment. And he gets a little teary-eyed there. That's It's a little cute. But, um, I'm still not sure if I saw this right, but I think the kyber crystal that Toby ends up finding and getting... Um, is act- it actually grew off one of the plants he-, he planted. Because, like, I was watching, and, I mean, it either grew off of a plant or came out of thin air, so I'm just gonna go with the plant, because that wouldn't make any sense. But when you sit down and think about it and say that out loud, like a kyber crystal grew off of a plant, it it sounds a little ridiculous. I mean, we know that's not how, you know, it goes in Star Wars, but for the moment, as you're watching it happen, it fits with the rest of the story, so... I won't go overkill on that little detail, but, however, I have to say that the idea of a robot child, or at least a being that's not organic, being able to use the Force and become a Jedi Knight, is a very interesting idea. It's definitely not something that I've ever thought about um, before, or being a possibility, but, so yeah, it's a thought to wrap your head around that's different. I mean, and again, it sounds a little ridiculous when you say it out loud, but for the story, it fits. So there you go. But it was pretty nice how Professor Mitaka knighted Toby as a Force Ghost. So when I say Professor Mitaka got killed because of Toby, he did. But he was he was a masterful Jedi enough to be a Force Ghost. So it's not entirely horrible. But still, that was his bad. But yeah, it was nice how Toby was still able to get knighted. And he kind of like... We're in this scene where time kind of freezes and Toby is in the same realm as Professor Mitaka, and he he sets him aside and he knights him. Um, so that was really cool. Um, so yeah, that means that the Professor must have been a Jedi who knew his stuff, because, you know, it takes quite the skills to be able to turn yourself into a Force Ghost. Um, if any of you have watched, like, Season 6 of The Clone Wars, they actually go into detail about that, and, like, how it actually has to be done. So... I mean, of course, that's not the point being made here, but just another side point that I thought about um, with the whole Force Ghost thing. Um, and I always bring up the fight scenes for each episode. I mean, I kind of have to. And even though the fight between the Inquisitor and Toby was like a, a rite of passage for him to becoming a knight, it didn't really seem like all that to me, you know? Like, not like this great fight that happens. And don't get me wrong, I was excited to see an Inquisitor in this episode. It was cool. Um... But there was nothing extraordinary about this fight that made me love it or especially like it. I mean, like, even when the Inquisitor gets struck down, it's nothing crazy or anything. You don't even, like, really see it happen. He just kind of stops and falls to the ground. So it's it's the average, like, eh, sort of fight. It's all right. But everything else ends on a nice note. Um, when Toby leaves the planet after he, you know, brings the Inquisitor down, um, he leaves to expand Professor um, Mitaka's quest of helping other planets to grow back and become fruitful again. So that's how it ends. And looking back on it as a whole, this wouldn't be an episode that I'd right away recommend to someone who's going to be either in or out on visions. Like for someone who would just want to get to the good stuff or else they're out. But I mean, no offense to Toby, but this one wasn't like a highlight for me. Um, it just didn't make it to like VIP status. So, um, but now episode seven, we're finally episode seven, guys. This was the one I 
been wanting to talk about for so long. This one is a whole different story for me. It's a whole different ball game. So, episode seven, The Elder. I love this one so much. Um, and based on the amount of times I've shown this one to like my family and the amount of times I rewatched it on my own, I'm gonna have to say that my, f- my favorite visions, anything, comes down to either this or the duel. Um, and honestly, I may be leaning towards this one a little bit more. And I think one of the things that tips the balance a little in the Elder's favor is the matter um, of the art style for me. And the animation for the duel is great. I mentioned that in the last episode, how it was super unique, and I enjoyed that. But um, the style for episode 7, it just has to be my favorite. It's super crisp, it's super smooth, and very slick looking. It's really cool. And, well, this is a little hard to explain, but I like how the movements are, like, fluid and a little choppy at the same time. And, like, just as an example of that, so you can kind of see where my head's at, I feel like the choppy and, like, fluid moments are kind of most apparent during the fights, where there's that initial strike that kind of, like, pounces on you and comes out of nowhere, like, wah! (laughs) But then you also get, like, the fluidity of some of the other movements being made in between those fast bang moves, or for just, like, simple actions, like what the characters are doing, like walking or whatever. Um, like, those would be more smooth. Um, and I don't know if that's something relatable that you guys may or may not have noticed. It might just be that I've watched it too many times, but I really think that episode 7 deserves some big props. I mean, the story itself had me going too. Like, just to get the whole duo thing going on with, like, a master and a Padawan pair... It just never gets old. We all love to see that dynamic and perspective. I know you love it. I love it. It's great. And actually, if you think about it, in no other Visions episode have we seen a Master and a Padawan together on a mission or anything, which makes it stand out just that much more for me a little bit. And um, and just coming off of that, I appreciated the characters and their portrayals and how within like 15, 20 minutes, you can get somewhat of a sense of their personalities and such. And I didn't catch his name, but I don't even think the dude had a name, actually. Um, but the master, who looks shockingly like Aizawa from MHA, you guys know, he looks just like him. But he came off as this super calm, wise Jedi who just knew things. Like, I would want him to train me. Like, he was super cool and chill. So I liked him right away. But um, Dan, the Padawan... He was a slightly, slightly different story for me. Like, not that I didn't like him. It's just that at the beginning with the opening scene where um, Dan and his master are talking in the ship, I don't know if this was just me, but, like, just how he was saying things, it seemed like he was being a little, a little cringe, like, or just corny, I guess is the better word, with just some of the things he said. Like, he would say things like, that's my master, I'm so happy to be your Padawan. Or like, (laughs) I don't know, just things like that. Whenever he said little comments like that, like a little muscle somewhere inside of me would cringe a little bit. But it's it's fine. Dan and I are cool. We're good. But, I mean, honestly, all the corny bits that I felt went away once he came face to face with the Elder. That little dude was nuts. (laughs) And I I got excited once um, the master felt that, like the disturbance in the force as they were in the ship, like when the episode was just beginning. Um, I mean, that's always the best indication that something's about to go down. If you think about it, it always happens. And that's when like something big happens. Um, but I mean, hey, Dan was aching for some action. So that's what he got. And I knew, <sighs> I knew it couldn't possibly be good when the master recommended that they both watch the ship, um, which was reasonable. But then Dan goes, Hey, better idea. How about I go off alone by myself in the hills while you watch the ship? And when he said that, I was like, Dan, bro, what good thing could come out of that situation? And what still surprises me about that was how the master let him go. I mean, I wouldn't have if I was him, but I guess, I don't know, the master trusted Dan enough, but it's still, that was a gray area. I was like, Dan, what do you, what do you want? What are are you trying to do? So that just had me kind of anticipating whenever the Elder would eventually show up, which was, you just felt it. So when Dan was turning around after, like, seeing the dead Vamga, I was three quarters of the way sure that the Elder was going to be behind him when he turned around. And then when he gasped, that just confirmed it. And uh, then you just get the feeling of, like, man, now Dan is in trouble. (laughs) But even though it's this, like, shriveled little old guy swinging lightsabers around, 
he has a very good take on a Star Wars villain, like a, a Sith-esque bad guy, and I really liked him. And, um, like, based on what he was saying to Dan and what the Master concluded by the end of the episode, here we have another used-to-be Sith who went off to do his own thing, um, like, in the duel with Ronin. Um, but the difference between the Elder and Ronin is that Ronin tries to do something better with that power and, and save people, whereas the Elder is still set on, like, killing Jedi and that old Sith way of thinking, like, let me kill whoever, wherever light side of the Force is. Um... And that's why he kind of, like, attracted them to the planet. It was kind of his plan to, to bring the Master and Dan in just because he wanted to he wanted to kill another Jedi. So, But it's interesting how with some of these episodes we're getting Sith who are kind of out of the loop. And I like it a lot. But back to the fight, or, like, part one of the fight, where the Elder and Dan are battling, you could obviously tell right away, like, Dan was barely holding his own against this guy. Um, he kept pushing against him and coming at him, like, super fast. So that was not a good sign. It took him, like, two two charges to for me to say, like, this is not gonna last that long. But, like, that one moment where he gets him in the stomach, like, I really thought he killed him there. Um, and plus, by this time, I was really invested in this episode, so when he got struck... I literally gasped out loud when that happened. Good thing I was alone, because that would have just been corny. But I really did gasp out loud, and I could not help it. And I was legitimately sad. I was sad, because in my mind, like, now the Master's gonna feel so guilty that he left him on his own, and now he's gonna have to live with this burden that his Padawan's dead. Plus, like, to me, and yes, I really have thought about this, one of, like, the saddest kinds of stories that I could think up in the Star Wars universe is when the Padawan gets killed. So Dan's death, quote-unquote death, actually hit me. It really did. However, I was discussing this with my brother the other day when I was showing this episode to him, actually. And, you know, now you know I wasn't joking about that earlier. I really do show these things to to everyone. But anyway, my brother was saying that he would have felt the impact more if Dan had stayed dead, which I I agree with that. I mean, like, of course, when I found out he wasn't dead, it relieved me a bit, um, but I couldn't help but think that it would have gotten to me more if it was a real death. I mean, but maybe we're going to see more of the Master and Padawan down the line, and maybe that's why Dan got spared, so I, I hope that's the reason. Um, so, yeah, Dan's not dead. But now, fast-forwarding a little bit to my favorite part of the short, of this whole thing is when Master comes to the rescue, and we get the fight in the rain between him and the Elder. And when the Elder is saying um, to the Master, like, I haven't fought a powerful Jedi like you in a while, it just kind of hit me like, man, the Master must be pretty powerful, and we're about to get a cool fight here. And I was not disappointed. And one thing that was quite notable from this fight that I took away was the Force Lightning. And I think... I mentioned this, how much I like Force Lightning already for the Twins episode um, last time, but it was so cool to see that from the Elder, and to me, this was also like a little funny part, because we reach this part in the fight where the Master's winning, and he just destroys one of the Elder's lightsabers, and he is getting visibly mad, like he's angry, and the entire expression on his face changes where he's just boiling and he like crunches up his hand in frustration and just unleashes the lightning which again like i was um saying in our last show it gives you some insight into how powerful this guy really is and how strong he actually is because force lightning requires a lot of skill and strength in the dark side of the force so that's one thing i don't know to to think about and at this point dan does kind of help save the day when he like force tosses his lightsaber at the elder just as he's about to take a swing at the master as he's like shooting um force lightning at him so props to you dan i'll give you the credit where it's due and uh dan's hero move provides like just the right opening and just like the right amount of time for the master's finishing blow of just holding the saber up to the dude's chest and just turning it on and off like, why is that such a hot fire move? I love that. I love it whenever that happens. And, I mean, now at least we know where Kylo Ren got it from, The Last Jedi. I mean, it's a great part for me. And um, one of the things I do wish coming out of this was that the fight was a little longer. Like, I, just some more, I don't know, 
not necessarily more detail, but just more, uh, just a little bit of extent, a- extension on that. But I mean, really, it's just me saying that because it's a short. I don't think they had much more room to do what they did. Um, cause I think it's one of the longest shorts too. I don't know if it's the longest one, but it's one of the longest ones. Um, but that's just my one wish. A little more length. But, now the fight is done, the heroes have prevailed, the elder's dead. And actually, one thing um, about the elder's death that I was not expecting was when he died, he just, like, he crumbles up. Like, when Jedi die, when they die, they just poof, gone. It's just poof. But when this guy dies, I guess it's just the opposite of that for Sith, maybe? Because when he dies, he just, like, turns into, I don't know, like, rocky dust or rocky dirt. And it was just very interesting. Like, I've never seen anything like that before. But yeah, so now the fight is done. The Elder's dead. And after everything, um, and, you know, uh, Dan is all healed up, and they both get to talking again, the Master makes a good point in saying, like, I don't think I would have been able to beat this guy had he not been so old. Which I do think is a valid point. I I mean, at first I was like, come on, man, you're, you're being too modest here. Give yourself some credit. But I don't think that's completely wrong to say. I mean, I'm very happy he didn't die, but the Elder was a quite the tough opponent. I have never seen such a strong darkness, I think is what the Master said about him. Um, but yeah, that's that's the end of it. And with all that being said, I truly want to see more of these two. And if anything at all, I want Star Wars to make another one for this story. If they only want to do one Visions episode and make another season, this is what I want them to do. But <laughs> we'll see where that goes. I don't know. Uh, but I hope so. Yeah, so that's episode seven. I'm so glad I, I got to, to talk about my, my favorite things about this because I just love this one. Um, but alrighty, so now I guess we can go on to episode eight, which is Lop and Ocho. And we only have two episodes left, so we're getting there. Um, this is the second to last one. But, uh, yeah, I thought this one was okay. I mean, it was, it was okay. Uh, it's, it's not very often though that we see, like, willful sympathizers and supporters for the empire i will say that because the sister in episode eight which her name is ocho i keep getting them confused but it's ocho ocho she like completely changes herself and is willing to fight for the empire to take over her planet um and that is not a super familiar thing like besides the actual generals for the empire that we see like you know thrawn tarkin etc but like, just a normal ruler pushing so hard for the Empire to take over her land. I mean, it actually, it made sense what she was saying about how and why they needed them and how they needed them to advance and do better. It was pretty logical, but it's just not something um, I've really seen much before this. But, you know, the Empire, once they come, they will not leave and they don't help. So that's what happens. They They end up just causing damage and not helping much. But Ocho decides to join them completely anyway. And in terms of who's the bad guy here, it's it's not like the case where we're seeing a Sith who's using the dark side fight a Jedi or anything. It's simply like an Imperial turned person against her sister who doesn't want her to change and, and go with the Imperials. And honestly, I didn't even notice that Lop, which is the adopted daughter of Ocho and her dad, I didn't even notice that Lop had the Force until I watched it much later, again, for this review. Which, like, even after finding that out, that she had the Force, it didn't add that much to the story for me anyway. But, um, I mean, I still think it's still, like, a, yeah story. But the thing that sort of stood out to me here was how, um, being a Jedi was portrayed as more of, like, an ancestral thing. Or at least with a lightsaber. Like, something that gets passed down to leading members of the family. Which I thought was an interesting way to think about the whole concept of the Jedi. Instead of, you know, being taken to the temple and trained, it's, like, being passed down. And, you know, if you are a stellar member of the family heritage, then you can have the lightsaber and use it. So that was kind of cool to think about it that way. But one thing that I thought was slightly ridiculous (laughs) from this episode... Um, I mean, not even slightly, it was just ridiculous, was how during the fight scene um, between Lop and Ocho, they're going at it, and, like, Lop force grabs the father's sword and is now fighting using the lightsaber and the sword at the same time. And she proceeds to literally slice Ocho in the shape of an X across her chest. 
and she still somehow did not die. And I know I could probably use the same argument for Dan in episode 7, but, I mean, as soon as that happened, she just, like, stood right back up with her hands in her pockets and went back with the Empire. And I was like, what the heck? What just happened? I mean, you're dead. But, I mean, whatever, I guess she's apparently not dead. But, you know, by the end of this episode, now everyone is is still mad at each other. And, I mean, now the father just has one less eye. (laughs) He really got the short end of the stick out of everyone. That was just cold. His own daughter took out his last eye. Now he's completely blind. I kind of feel the worst for him. Um, I mean, so yeah, as you can tell, all in all, this one didn't make it that much for me. I don't have to see it again. Um, So, yeah, Lapinocha was all right. It was okay. Um, But with that, we finally made it to our last vision short, which is episode 9, Akakiri. I really hope I'm saying that right. I don't think there's another way to say that, though. I mean, Akakiri. Akakiri. Ooh. No, I don't know. It's Akakiri. Um, so, yeah, this is episode 9. And, all right, so I had to rethink entirely how I was going to talk about this one. Because with my initial watch, I kind of came out of it thinking that it was super weird. I just did not like it. I didn't like the ending. I didn't like the style. I was just not feeling it in all aspects. Um, so I was, like, about to unleash my thought on how strange I thought this was, but that's why you should watch things twice sometimes, because now I understand much better the whole thing that Akakiri was going for, and now it's alright for me. I don't love it, I definitely don't hate it, but it's very interesting, and it makes you think at the end as things start getting revealed. Um, and that's probably why with this one you should watch it twice, because with the things that the characters say throughout, like at the beginning, middle, um, it ends up coming to a head with, like, the final decision that the main character, Tsubaki, makes, and you just, like, catch things that have more meaning later on. Um, I mean, which goes a lot for shows and movies generally, actually, so it's never a bad idea to rewatch, unless it's just horrible. But for this, it's not horrible, so that's why you should take another look. But the whole situation with episode 9 is that a land has been taken over and is now being ruled by a Sith Lord, who was part of the royal family and, like, just forced her way to power. And this Jedi, Subaki, he goes back to this planet to help the princess of the land, um, who's also the forbidden love of the Jedi, as the description in the episode says. I think I got some vibes of that, but not strong vibes, you know what I mean? But, yeah, she's the forbidden love of this Jedi, um... But he, he goes back there and helps her to get the Sith ruler out of power. So it begins with him crash landing on the planet. Now, as we learn later on, we find out that Tsubaki is there and is compelled to go there at all because of a continuous force vision he kept getting where he kept seeing someone dying over and over again. Um, he doesn't know who it is or who is doing the killing, but he knows it's, he knows that it happens on this planet. So he goes to stop it from happening. And this actually ended up being something that I really appreciated um, and kind of made me go like, huh, at the end of everything. Because it turns out that um, it's one of those situations where a Jedi sees a Force vision and wants to prevent it, whatever is happening in it. But in the process of preventing the Force vision, they trigger the cause of whatever tragic thing they foresaw. Which is terribly ironic and it makes so much sense, but sort of makes your head spin at the same time. But it's just so, it's so cool how that works. And sad, but it's cool. (laughs) And, I mean, that's what happens here. So inevitably, the Jedi and his girlfriend, not girlfriend, Misa, travel to the palace where Auntie Sith Lord is and face, I love calling her Auntie Sith Lord. Let's just do that. Uh, So they go there and they face off with her. And there's a part where Tsubaki is, is not winning at the moment. So this Auntie Sith Lord is doing, like, that force thing where he's he's just in pain. And so that that's the part where Misa gets separated from Tsubaki. So now he does not see where she is. And a bunch of these masked henchmen are trying to take swings at Tsubaki. So he's slicing them down one by one like nobody's business. And he takes a swing at the last henchman. And as soon as he does, he hears a scream and he immediately realizes it's the exact moment that he saw in his force vision. And not only that, but as he's taking off the mask, he confirms that he has just killed Misa. And for the viewer, or at least for me, as soon as it hits you that 
it was going to be him the whole time who killed um, this person. Like, not just a random person, but this person who he loved. It's such an, like, oh, now I see it moment. And it's just sad because he realizes what what just happened and the whole thing with the Force Vision was him killing this person. And he's sitting there crying, realizing what he's just done. And this is where things start to line up as well because throughout the whole rest of the episode, Tsubaki had been, like, strongly defending the idea that, like, nothing is set in stone. nothing, The future is not predestined. And yet he foresaw himself killing a loved one and still ended up doing it. So, like, the irony just kills you here. And this is why Master Yoda always has said to take a chill pill whenever you get a force vision and, like, want to react to it. Because in most cases, if you do nothing, it won't happen. Because a lot of times the force vision is caused by something you would end up doing to stop the force vision from happening. And on top of that, Tsubaki's master... Um, had warned him, this was, like, told to us in a flashback, um, but his master had warned him that he should send someone else to go to the planet instead of himself, because if something happens and this force vision ends up being you causing it, there's nothing I'll be able to do to help you out of it. And, of course, that's the exact situation that our troubled Jedi friend finds himself in. However, it's not the end, because... Auntie Sith Lord. <laughs> I, I have to say it now because in my outline I have Sith Ruler, but it's. We have to say Auntie Sith Lord now. So, Auntie Sith Lord has an offer. She is not done yet. She says that if you open yourself up to the dark side, not only can you save Misa, but you can also stop things like this from um, being predestined and also change how things are going to happen in the future. And. At first, um, Tsubaki's is upset and he, de- he denies anything can be done about what has just happened. But then she actually helps him heal Misa back to life and she's actually living again, which was actually very surprising to me because I think back to like the other time when something reminiscent of the situation happens where Palpatine tells Anakin that they could use the dark side to stop Padme from dying and in that case, that never came to fruition because she still died. Um, so I always just thought that Palpatine was just throwing things out there to seduce Anakin even further, which he was, but I just always thought he was lying about that ability to stop death. But after seeing this, like a Sith and also Tsubaki accomplish the complete reversal of death entirely makes me rethink that because could Palpatine actually have stopped Padme from dying if he really wanted to? And he obviously didn't because he wanted to, you know, continue manipulating Anakin. But it was an interesting thought to have if he really could do that. Um, I really hope there's, like, not a blatantly obvious answer to that somewhere that I don't know about. Because I don't want to sound dumb. But that was just something that came to my mind in relation to that whole concept from this episode of, you know, death being able to be reversed or undone. Um, So I think that the Jedi story here is very relatable and comparable in a few ways to Anakin's story, um, including how um, Tsubaki makes the switch from light to dark side, which was relatively fast. I mean, with Anakin, things were definitely done with a more gl- gradual slip, very gradual, over like his whole life. But here it was sprinkled along as the plot went, just faster. So, I mean, that's what you can expect from a 15-minute short. Um, but it was, yeah, just not as gradual. It, w- it had some gradualness to it. But that was the other thing that made me think Akakiri was weird originally, because I felt that um, Tsubaki's turn to the dark side and joining forces completely with the Sith Lord was just way too fast and too spontaneous. I did not like that at all. But now I can see more that it was just him wanting to have that power to prevent deaths, like what he had inflicted, from happening again, and to have the power to prove to himself and others, I guess, that the future is never set. And that was just something that um, you could tell clearly he was fighting the whole time in this whole episode. So now that he he feels that he can stop the future and change whatever's going to happen, that's why he wants his power so bad. And now, after that whole ordeal, Tsubaki is pretty much convinced that the dark side has more to offer than the light after I mean, bringing someone back to life with it, which makes it a decision that he just decides on the spot and goes with faster. And as an aspect to think of towards the end that also adds some more meaning to this is Misa's reaction to being brought back to life. I mean, if it was you, you would probably think to be like, 
you know, happy at least. Like, there was no thank yous, no, like, how did you do that? Or, like, I'm glad you could save me. How could I repay you? There was nothing. The first thing she says is, what did you do? Because she can tell her friend had changed. I mean, you could just see it um, in his whole, like, stature and his posture. And you could see that he had to go to a dark place and cross some lines to do what he did to save her. Which also, again, relates much to Anakin, because once Padme realized that Anakin would do anything to save her, including stepping over from good into bad, she tries to turn him back by saying, like, you're a good person, don't do this. And I got that same sort of message from Misa and how she reacted to everything. Like, did you just turn bad to bring me back to life? So now Subaki went to, he went to the planet expecting to take the Sith down, when he ended up joining her and strengthening her forces times two. So I just feel like a good way to describe this episode in a nutshell would be like coordinated with like the force visions and everything thought out and like foreshadowing sprinkled in and just thought provoking. And yeah, it was, I actually appreciate it a lot more than I did originally. And it is okay in my book. It is okay. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, yeah, I guess that's it for Akikiri, the last visions episode. However, one thing I wanted to bring up um, before we close out on the show for today is a question that we've all inevitably wondered about at this point, and it's something that I've heard a lot about regarding Visions entirely, So, uh, and that's whether if this fine series or any of the episodes specifically are canon or not. Like, what is the canonicity of Visions? Now, I know that there's people out there who are either in or out on something based on whether it's canon or not. Like, as soon as they hear that this is Legends, or that is not the new canon, or this is that, or whatever, they just kind of say, I mean, why should I care? I'm out. And I will say, there is sense in that. Like, I could see that logic, and, I mean, absolutely, you could spend your whole life reading and watching only canon things and never be bored, ever. But you just cut yourself off from a lot and miss out on these, like, great stories that could have been founded on some of the things that we do see in canon now. Like, for example... In the Legends books, there's a series about a Sith named Darth Bane, and it's amazing, or like so I've heard, because I haven't actually read it, but it is not canon anymore. However, the same character from that book was used in an episode of The Clone Wars, and the entire principle of the book and what he did in it was mentioned in the canon environment. So there's times like that where you could see Legends resurface again, but for Vision specifically, I've looked at a few sources on where it stands with canon and everything, and the unified answer is that it's not canon now, but it could be down the line, or that it's in that gray area of, like, the viewer can decide, and that it's in the middle of not exactly canon, but not that it could never be. And that's because of um, the, the whole principle that each episode could fit somewhere into the canon Star Wars timeline of what we know. And, I mean, sure they could, whether it's, like, past, present, future, whatever. Um, like, for example, Tatooine Rhapsody could easily fit in. So, like, things like that could still be inserted. And the thing about that is, like, are some of the episodes more realistic? Like, more Star Wars realistic than others? In my opinion, absolutely. And that's why I would argue that episodes like The Twins or um, TB01 would be, like, they would have much of a less chance becoming cemented into Star Wars than something like The Elder or Ronin. But, I mean, is Star Wars or Lucasfilm releasing Visions explicitly saying that they actually happened? No. But they made it clear that that was not the intention of Visions. The idea was to make something new and different and to celebrate the franchise. So canonicity was not, was just not made a priority. So in short, it's not really canon, but they could have happened. Um, and I hope that doesn't disappoint some of you or discourage you from watching it if you haven't got to the rest of them already, but they're still really good stories, and of course, I still do recommend them to you all. Um, but yeah, with that, I guess that wraps everything up, and we have finally made it to the end of our Visions discussion. That was fun, and I had, and it was like an awesome way to break into the podcast. Um, and I hope you all enjoyed that and everything I had to say about each of the episodes. I hope you liked it. Um, and I am very excited for next week because I'm bringing in the main event for a review, one of my favorite comics of all time, coming from DC, which is, drumroll please, 
JLA Tower of Babel. Um, and I, I can't tell you how excited I am to talk about this comic specifically. It's such a good story. So if you guys like Justice League stories or a good Batman moment, you have to tune in next time because we're going to be talking all about that. It's going to be a blast, so do not miss it. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm planning for next time. And I hope you guys enjoyed today's show. If you're liking what you're hearing, don't forget to leave a review. And if you have any reviews that you want read on the show about things that you're looking into, or um, if you have any suggestions, questions, or anything at all, remember you can always send those through to me at a piece of everything reviews at gmail.com, and I will definitely get back to you. Thanks for listening, my friends, my dedicated listeners, and may the force be with you. Bye!